Hello and welcome to Mac Power Users. My name is Stephen Hackett. I'm joined by my friend and yours, Sir David Sparks. Hey, Stephen. Hey, David. How are you? I am great. I'm uh, looking forward to today's episode and uh, want to welcome to the show Neil Javari, developer of MimeStream. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on here. I'm uh, really excited to uh, join both of you and uh, talk about some some fun topics. Yeah, well, we have a lot to talk about with email and MimeStream uh, with you today, Neil. Uh, it's just really impressive what you've done. But I guess we've got a little startup business we've got to cover first, though. Yeah, a little bit of housekeeping this week. Um, we wanted to extend our condolences to the family of Charles Edge and the Mac Adamant community at large. Uh, Charles was co-host of the Mac Adamant's podcast, wrote just a stack of books. If you spent time in Mac administration, Mac OS server, anything in that realm, you've come across his work. And unfortunately, Charles passed away unexpectedly. Uh, about a week ago, um, really sad news. You know, I've spoken to him and his co-host and people in that organization on and off, off over the years, um, and it's really heartbreaking. And so, uh, check out the links in the show notes. Uh, Tidbits has a nice thing, and there's a really nice page over on macadmins.org uh, with notes from members of the community remembering Charles and his work. And so. I was absolutely gutted when I saw this news the other day and wanted to share it uh, with the MPU family because there's a lot of a lot of overlap in our two shows and uh, it's really just uh, just a, a sad day for the community. Tragic to you, you know. Absolutely. Um, today on more power users, uh, we're gonna since we've got Neil here, we're gonna be talking about AI in software. AI is a topic a lot of people are interested in these days. We're gonna have a show on it next week, actually. But this new idea of putting AI right into the software is something that uh, we're curious about. We, while we've got Neil here, we're going to ask him some questions. So that will be fun. Neil, tell us a little bit about your background. Well, uh, you know, I'm excited to uh, talk to you guys about my stream and sort of how I got here. Uh, yeah. So my background, let's see, you know, like a lot of people in my industry, I got my my start kind of early, uh, you know, as a kid, computers were just sort of what I gravitated to, uh, sure. you know, and it just sort of started like I got my start with some, you know, just getting started with programming in high school. Um, and, you know, by the time I got to college, I knew I wanted to be a computer science major right off the bat. So I did that um, at the University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, so I grew up in Maryland, born and raised. And uh, went to, went to college of Maryland. And, uh, after that, I worked at a small consulting company, uh, software consulting company in, in DC. And that actually was a really interesting experience for me because it was such a contrast from sort of the rest of my career that like, it's a time I go back to and think about quite fondly. Um, and you know, it's a great reminder of just like how to build software on the other side of the 80 20 split uh you know when you're working on productivity software you wind up kind of thinking a lot about like that last 20 percent, and that winds up taking up 80 percent of your time yeah in a consulting environment you're trying to get 80 percent of the value in 20 percent of the time uh and so it was just a really useful uh really useful start to my career i didn't know it at the time i appreciate it a lot more now hmm. in uh in retrospect but yeah i was doing like web apps and things like that um and uh you know it was just kind of like a bunch of custom web apps like php uh even some cold fusion if that rings a bell for anyone yeah. uh oh boy i actually enjoyed i actually enjoyed uh using that quite a bit um but uh, yeah, after I did that for about a year, uh, I decided to try my hand going the academic route. So I went to grad school for computer science. Um, and, uh, you know, after doing that for a little bit, I actually had a friend uh, that had gone to Apple. And funny enough, at this time, I was not really an Apple user myself. Like, I didn't have any Apple products. Uh, I was just firmly ensconced in the whole Windows world. That was just kind of where I got started. Uh, and, uh, you know, so he was at Apple and he was like, oh, my God, this is great. Like, this is you should really think about interviewing here. Um, and, uh, you know, I said, sure, why not? 
Uh, so, you know, I head out to Cupertino and, you know, I, uh, I show up for an interview uh, with the Apple Mail team. Uh, and funny enough, I had never used Apple Mail. Sure. Uh, in my life. <laughs> I never used a Mac before either. Uh, and so I'm showing up for this interview and just kind of like, you know, I think I think Apple in that day and age was really used to like hiring people who were super fans already. Like if you weren't already like a really serious, uh, you know, Mac nerd, you weren't really going to be, you know, getting your foot in the door. Sure. If you didn't, if you didn't already believe, right? Yeah. If you didn't already believe and I. I don't know that I didn't believe. I just didn't know because yeah. I just had just I was just in that in that this was like 2009. Because you you're of an age, right? We grew up. You kind of chose sides when you were a kid with your technology, right? Yeah, kind of. I don't even know that I deliberately chose a side. It just was yeah. sort of the default side. And I just wound up. I just was there. And, you know, I mean, when I was in college, I switched to mostly, you know, using Linux. Um, so, you know, I. I guess I started on the Windows side, then I went to Linux for a while, and then and then I came over to uh, to to the Mac, um, and you know, obviously have not looked back since. But uh, yeah, I was a late I was a late bloomer. <laughs> to, <laughs> I saw the light uh, kind of late, uh, which is a, a little different for most people who are now you know in in I guess in my position. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a really interesting experience. So somehow or the other, despite never having touched a Mac, you know, I got a job offer from from Apple, and you know, back then, and you know, went out to Cupertino at the start of uh, January 2010, I think it was. Wow, um, what a time to join Apple! January 2010 yeah. is the iPad introduction. Yeah, right before the iPad came out. Um, so I showed up and, you know, I thought I was going to be working on, um, you know, m- mail for, uh, you know, it was 10 and, and they're like, actually mail for <laughs> iPad. <laughs> here's this, here's this funny looking device in this, you know, suitcase kind of contraption to like hide the industrial design inside. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, by the way, you have to, you have to be in this locked office with like all these curtains drawn and everything. And, you know, you have to, <laughs> it, it's behind all these badge and doors and everything. Um, uh, that was a really fun, a really fun time, uh, and, and like a really special time, uh, as well. Um, you know, I think at the time I didn't really like know what I was getting into, uh, both with email and also with Apple. Uh, but uh, you know, obviously I fell in love with it all pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so I got my start with that working on mail for the iPad. And then, um, you know, then I really switched to working on mail for, for OS 10. Kind of the big first release I worked on was, um, for Lion, uh, which introduced conversation view and a couple other features, but the major feature it introduced was like conversation view and that, three pane split view as opposed to that old classic, you know, table view above and then message, you know, message preview pane below. Uh, It it sort of did that, that, that switch. So that was my, my first real time working on email related things. Um, And that was a really great, it was a great year. Um, That was, you know, that, that team at that time was like just, there was a lot of innovation happening. I felt like there was a that, that that was a great year for 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 mail in terms of feeling like it was a major step forward. So you were there kind of for the development of the iPad, but then Lion was the kind of the big back to the Mac year. So you kind of got over to the Mac when that was interesting as well. Yep. Yep. So at the time it was kind of the the iPad release. It's funny, you know, they sort of shuffled people around, but uh, you know, at the time, I guess the 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 OS 10 team had a little extra cycles, so they were sort of like some of us were repurposed to working on the 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 iPad. Uh, you know, Apple, especially in that era, was pretty good about rotating people in and out, and sort of you know just getting the manpower necessary to work on specific projects that were you know under the under the gun in terms of like a time frame and a release schedule. Um, and so that's where I, you know, we got kind of moved around um, a fair bit, but all working within the same kind mm-hmm. of, you know, email 
space and the code yeah. base was all pretty, you know, there's a lot of similarities there. So it was pretty seamless for us to be hopping around. Well, one thing I have to ask is, so you're new to the Mac at the same time you're making the Mac's mail application. <laughs> it's like, what was that like? Like when you started and you're like, well, wait a second, like this doesn't act like windows or, I mean, I mean, it's, the Mac is a little different and everybody around you is like very used to the way the Mac UI works and it's brand new to you. Was that like, did you have to like secretly like bone up on it or how did you get <laughs> caught up with that? You know, it it's funny. There, there, there were a lot of tips and tricks that I think took me a few years to really get to the bottom of. Um, but it, it was like, you know, it was, it's an easy, it's an easy to understand platform. And, you know, I think the first, you know, day or two, I was a little confused and I, I had an office mate at the time, like a, you know, kind of like Apple was very big on not having at, at least most of the software engineering teams weren't in like open floor plans at that time. Um, they were individual offices and, you know, when space got tight, they would put two people in one office. Uh, so I had an office mate and, uh, you know, I bugged the guy and just asked a bunch of questions about really, really silly stuff. Uh, I remember the first week and he was just like, how did they hire you? <laughs> 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 you don't know how to restart your Mac. <laughs> Where's the special menu? Uh, man, I just looked up a, uh, uh, out of my own library, a, a screenshot of mail from lion. A lot of stuff going on in mail back in those days. Notes and reminders are in there. There is the whole concept of like stationary where you could send oh, like yeah. rich <laughs> emails, L- lots of stuff going on. And I know later on at Apple, you spent time uh, on notes, but when you came in there, mail's doing a lot of stuff, right? And the slowly those things kind of got broken down, really starting at mountain lion. If you can, w- right. what was that process like? And was that refreshing to sort of pair mail back? just to be like a really good email client and not worry about the other stuff. Yeah. So I was there for all of that really. And that was, you know, it was very interesting that that's what I, it was definitely the right direction um, for, for the app to go. And it, it did, you know, mail did do a lot. There was even like, in addition to there being reminders and, and, and notes in mail, there was, actually rss reading functionality which are god about yeah, that yeah in, in retrospect it, it wasn't it, it wasn't like you know notes was maybe just like didn't really make a lot of sense in your email client but like rss is like a little bit arguable you know rss i think is just kind of like it's a little geeky it didn't really go super super mainstream so it made sense for that to go from the app but uh yeah mail mail did a lot um a lot back in the day uh, I'm I'm glad that things got got broken out, but uh, you know, so what was it? Line was a big release for us in terms of switching mail to have the new modern like interface layout and doing conversation view, um, as opposed to like the simpler threading model that it was doing before. Uh, for Mountain Lion, we decided to bring notes out of mail and into a separate app. Uh, and it was already a separate app on iOS, mm-hmm. um, which I don't even know if that, I don't even know if it was rebranded to iOS yet at this point, or if it was still iPhone OS. Uh, but I don't know, something for the history books to, to look up. So pulling mail, uh, sorry, pulling notes out was, I mean, I think if I look back, that might have been the funnest project that I worked on while I was at Apple, because that was like. You know, I was literally the guy that was like file, like, you know, new Xcode project for notes on Mac OS. Like, cool. And I just started actually like building the first version of notes for the Mac. And, you know, I remember sort of like at the time I mostly did UI engineering um, rather than much of the, you know, the, the back end side. So I was just focused on just trying to replicate the UI experience pulling out the bits and pieces of code from mail that did like, you know, the, the UI of notes. Remember it looked like an actual like legal pad had like a yellow background, like blue lines, like the red ruling on the, uh, on, on, on the note and like the text you'd type would actually snap to the blue lines. It was, it was kind of (laughs) silly in retrospect, but it was, there, there was something nice to it too. 
um, skeuomorphic design is a is an is an interesting topic. Um, but yeah, so I you know I remember just the the feeling of just like it felt like I was tinkering almost, um, but pulling as much as I could out and then just replicating what couldn't be pulled out. Um, that was sort of like a great first, a great start to a uh, great start to notes. Um, and then I was joined later on after I did that for like one or two sprints was joined by, you know, another engineer and then a handful of others, um, to work on like the back end of notes as a brand new Mac app. Um, and you know, the challenge with that was notes today is kind of a little bit of a different beast from notes in, in mountain lion notes in mountain lion all like really just used IMAP mm -hmm. and EWS to sync. So yeah. it literally was just, it had to do the email protocol. So that was just not the optimal decision from a, uh, like it's not what really any engineer would have wanted to do, but it was the only practical choice that could have been made given the fact that there were so many pre-existing products that already were doing this. Right. So like, you know, you already had people with notes in mail. Lots of folks had multiple Macs, like they had a desktop and a laptop. And there was iPhones out there already that, you know, were, were running a previous version of the OS. And so there was just no choice except to just continue with the IMAP syncing. Yeah, and we were all making fun of it from the outside. We're like, I can't believe these guys. IMAP for note sync, you know? <laughs> oh, it's not the optimal protocol for that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, it's all moved on. Yeah, but and it also really feels to me like though that was the start of something because you know a running theme we've had on this show is the way Apple's productivity suite, uh, all of their apps, you know, Notes, Mail, uh, the iWork suite, like Apple has really, I feel like, upped their game on a lot of those apps over the last you know five to ten years. Where it's like, no, they're really making the built-in apps usable. Reminders is another one we hear from listeners all the time who had you know uh, paid for task managers but now they've decided reminders is good enough and it, it just feels to me like you were there during a period when apple kind of made that decision and started taking those initial steps yeah i was there from january 2010 to around june 2017 so that was an interesting you know that was definitely an era where i guess a lot of the productivity apps the built-in productivity apps really matured um, quite a bit. And some were just, you know, like for instance, notes was just created from, from scratch, uh, on, on the Mac and, you know, and reminders also, I remember the, I had some friends working on reminders and they were building that for, for, you know, to start. So there was a lot of, a lot of, uh, innovation, um, happening in the productivity side in that, in that time. And, uh, yeah, it was exciting. I think that, um, you know, the, the notes team, especially, I think, has done a really good job uh, continuing to iterate it. You know, they finally got off of IMAP syncing for notes and they sort of got a few years ago, they had people migrate to iCloud or CloudKit based syncing for, for notes, which just works quite a bit better and sort of set the stage for them to have a whole bunch of additional features like sharing and, and collaboration. Um, notes, I think, is just a really powerful little simple productivity app it might be i think it's my favorite apple made productivity app actually right now uh and that's not just because i you know you know was involved because in you started the project <laughs> <laughs> well, i started it on the mac it was already yeah. there on the on the iphone but i did start the, the one on the mac and uh so that that was but i think you know the way that it's evolved has evolved to something that's like just really compelling it's like you know it it's good enough for a lot of folks. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it covers a lot of the, a lot of the bases. And it's not simple anymore either. I mean, it's, it's got, I mean, it is simple in execution, but it has some really powerful features. We did a whole show on it about six months ago. And again, so many listeners are just all in with notes now. And that was not the case back in the day when it was like only on your iPhone with the marker felt font and the, you know, it was, it, Again, it's just an app that has transformed itself. Yeah, it's amazing to me how a couple 
extra iterations made it go from, because I, I remember the era of using notes only as this very like lightweight thing of like, oh, like, you know, I'm on the phone with some customer support agent that they gave me a case number and I just need to write it down somewhere. So I'll just mm-hmm. take it in notes. Whereas now it's like uh, all my doc, like all my records, it's like my full blown journal of all my work and my life is like everything lives in notes now. Um, and I have like a massive notes library. It is one of my most, it's one of my most used apps aside from my own. Um, it is remarkable how that evolution was possible just from, a, I mean, the, the fundamental user experience is sort of the same, but a few minor tweaks made a lot of difference, I think, in, in terms of how usable it was for a little bit more of a serious workflow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Apple's done a fantastic job with that, with that app. I think that that app has just really come a long way. So you're you're working in the in these productivity apps there in, in the beginning, literally the beginning <laughs> for some of them, um, but you end up exiting Apple and uh, I guess a few years later end up deciding, hey, let's do that again. Let's make a mail app for the Mac. What went into that decision? How did you end up there? Oh boy. Well, you know, I think I think if, I think if I, I look at it in terms of the second ch- chapter of my my career at Apple. So I started as like a hands-on software engineer for the first few years and then I moved into engineering management at Apple and that was really by the time I left I was managing a team of 9. So most of my day was kind of a little bit more involved in like managing people, managing tasks and project planning and things like that and I think I just got a little bit away from the magic of making software uh and the magic of making things with my 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 own two hands is just something i've always enjoyed a lot um so i knew that i always wanted to try my hand at starting a company and you know when i think i i just turned 30 around that time and i started to think about what would be the next sort of step or next chapter and i started to feel like okay if i'm going to start a company like you know now is kind of a good time um, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I certainly 100% did not think I was going <laughs> to touch email with a nine foot pole because I knew how complicated it was. Like I, I, you know, I had worked in the sausage factory. I knew how the sausage was made. I <laughs> Yeah. Well, just on that point, I mean, I feel like there's just a graveyard of third party mail apps that people think they can do it. And, uh, there's just so much to making mail work, right? And, and reliably that I think it's a very hard problem to solve. So you're absolutely correct. I think a lot of people would be very intimidated by the idea of trying to make your own mail app. Yeah. I think, you know, the people that do it either a don't know better or B have a very high threshold for, for pain and they know what they're getting into. Uh, I probably am in the second, I'm, I'm in the second you know bucket, but uh, mm-hmm. I, I, th- I think the people there's a lot of people, like a lot of people that I talked to who'd worked on mail. They're like, yeah, I would never try to make a mail app <laughs> Like after having worked on this. It is it is hard. The, all the simple things are remarkably hard in, in email. And that's just something that I hear not only from people who've worked on Apple Mail, but like I've got a lot of industry contacts and everyone just keeps having the same complaint that like, you know, the simple things in email are wind up being remarkably hard. Actually, in contrast, when I worked on notes, it was just like the actual process of building the app aside from the sync layer was a lot more straightforward. Um, And it kind of was like, oh, this is a throwback to like how software development can be when, you know, things don't, when, when, when you can just sort of like, you have a little bit more of a straightforward set of requirements, you know, Mm -hmm. and you don't have to fight the, you don't have to fight the frameworks to get this little customization that everyone depends on um, and everyone expects, but it's just not, not the simple way to do things. Uh, so it was, it was really nice in contrast working on notes, but anyway, coming back to what led me to leave, it was just a, a, a desire to start a company in the abstract. Um, and I did not know at all what I was really going to dig into. Hmm. Um, I was actually very interested in the healthcare technology space. Uh, and I had done a little bit of consulting work uh, to sort of dip my feet into that after I had left. 
um, hoping that it would sort of illuminate the right concept or a, 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 you know, revision of a concept that I had. And, you know, ultimately I, after like six months or so, I started growing a little bit frustrated with all of that. And I was just like, you know, I'm going to just, just take a little break and just start, you know, maybe work in a little bit on an email client. Um, so I went back and forth between these two things of doing some consulting work, uh, trying to find the right idea, working on my little pet project to learn Swift. Uh, <laughs> uh, the pet project being now mime stream. <laughs> um, and <laughs> some people made like a hello world app. You're just out there like, you know what? I think my hobby project to learn is going to be a mail application. I, I love it. Uh, you know, it was what I knew. It was what I knew. It was what I worked on. It was, I was just like, oh, I'm just, you know, it was kind of like a relaxing weekend thing. Um, but you know, and it was, it, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. I, I did not, Swift was a new language at the time. Um, Swift had just kind of started to get going at the end of my time in Apple and I never got a chance to play with it when I was there. And you know, that too in engineering management, like I wasn't even, I was writing five hours of code a week, maybe. Uh, so I was kind of just distant from it all. And most of it was like, oh, you know, going back to code that I had written a couple of years ago or something like that and just fixing a minor bug because like I saw the bug come in and I knew exactly where the problem was and I knew exactly how to fix it. So I just would do it. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, you know, I didn't really get a chance to play with Swift. So that, that, that was something that made me, you know, kind of interested in having like a little hobby project. But uh, yeah, I shared it with some friends and that's when I started to, you know, that's when I started to hear, you should do this. And yeah. I was like, no, I shouldn't do this. I really shouldn't try to start an email client. I shouldn't start an email app. I should not start a company based around email. But uh, I shared it with a few friends and they, they loved the early builds. And they were like, you should just make this and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so then it was like, you know, 2019 at this time. And I just decided, okay, let's, let's try this. Let's see what happens. I'll give it like, you know, I'll, I'll give it like a year or two, um, and, and see where this goes. So I worked on a beta and, you know, I had like 10 friends using the app and, I was looking for, you know, a couple more people to try it out. So I went to, you know, I, I went to Hacker News and I posted about it on Hacker News. And then, you know, the next day I woke up to like 40,000 people having downloaded the app. And I was like, uh-oh. Yep. Uh, I <laughs> think I was one of them. This <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, I'm not ready for this many beta users. I had like 10 people beta testing it beforehand. <laughs> and so all of a sudden now I've got, okay, I guess I'm in it now. Uh, so that was, that was a, and then, you know, some, some, some other places had like written about it based off of that. And I was just like, okay, I was not expecting this. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, I wasn't really prepared for it either, but that was a scrambly time. Uh, but that's when it felt like, okay, you know, I had this beta I was receiving. I, I still remember the first week after launching on or announcing the availability of this beta on Hacker News. Uh, I mean, like just my email inbox, I was just getting an email like once every minute. Like it was just like, just a, I, I dropped the ball on most emails that I received during that time only because it was impossible to possibly respond to everyone. I mean, I did my best, but like when you're receiving one email a minute, there's only so much you can do. And then after a while, it's just like, I'm just going to scan this, you know, uh, but that, that really made it clear to me. I was like, okay, some people care. <laughs> like. They're, they're, they care enough to be sending, you know, typing up not just these little bug reports, but these like long essays. And that, that I think was really made it clear to me that this maybe was worth pursuing mm -hmm. was the number of like multi-page essays that I received. Uh, and I was just like, oh, wow, people, people care about this topic. Yeah. This is, this is, this is great to see. Um, you know, it, it was, it was something that I, I think I always intrinsically knew, but like, you know, as an engineer at a, at a really big company, you're sort of like insulated, like you're not interacting directly with customers. You're just 
you know, you, there's a whole support team and there's a whole, you know, product team. There's so many different functions and you're so insulated from actually dealing with any customers um, that you sort of don't really get to see that kind of feedback firsthand. Hmm. Uh, whereas, you know, when you're just like doing it yourself as an indie, right, you get to see all of that. So it was really exciting. I think that was what cemented it for me as like, okay, like we're going to try this. I think this could potentially be a viable business. Uh, and so that was more or less a couple unintentional starts. That's how we wound up where we are. Well, you know, like I was saying earlier, email is a difficult problem, but people so desperately want a good email app. And, and that's why I feel like congratulations are in order. I mean, you're, you've got one of the only email apps that people don't complain about, you know? <laughs> and, uh, I guess if people are complaining, we, we put a note in the, um, in the Mac power users forums that you were coming on the show. And the complaint was, well, it's just Gmail. How come we can't use it with our mail? In fact, <laughs> I wrote you to ask about that too. So it's, I think it's just a, uh, it's the only problem people have is they can't get it. Yeah. You know, for email, I will definitely take the, you know, lack of compliments or lack of complaints as the the best possible compliment um yeah you know i think that for something like this you know people try to do things that like reinvent email um and we can get into that you know a little bit more but uh you know that, that that's not sort of the spirit of mindstream the spirit of mindstream was just to to do the thing that it's supposed to do mm-hmm. and to try to do it well yeah um and and not try to you know flip anything on its head um but just try to give you everything that you need to do uh so yeah it was uh, i appreciate the compliments you know this episode of the mac power users is brought to you by squarespace save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain using the code mpu just go to squarespace.com slash mpu Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, you can stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything, your products, services, and even the content you create. Squarespace has got everything you need all in one place, all on your terms. Their blueprint, AI, and SEO tools make it so easy to get started. And you can start a completely personalized website with their new guided design system, Squarespace Blueprint. Choose from professionally curated layout and styling options to build a unique online presence from the ground up, tailored to your brand or business, and optimized for every device. And then easily launch your website and get discovered fast with integrated, optimized SEO tools so you show up more often to more people and grow the way you want. You can also integrate flexible payments to make checkout seamless for your customers with simple but powerful payment tools. Accept credit cards, PayPal and Apple Pay, and in eligible countries, offer customers the option to buy now and pay later with Afterpay and Clearpay. With Squarespace, you can make the most of AI, kickstart, or update written content on any website, product description, or email with Squarespace AI, generating instant, personalized results that know and show your brand identity. Explain what your site is about, choose your tone, and enter what you need to get short or long-form text. No matter the placement, Squarespace AI makes it easier to go live, stand out, and succeed online. I've been using Squarespace since version 1. I'm a fan. I still have an active Squarespace website. What I like about it is that it's just so easy to manage, and it's so reliable. Squarespace does all the hard work for you, so you can just make a beautiful website that does what you need it to do. Anybody looking to get started with a website for their business or really for any reason should check out Squarespace. Head to squarespace.com slash MPU right now to sign up for that free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash MPU to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That URL one last time is squarespace.com slash MPU. When you decide to sign up, get that 10% off your first purchase and to show your support for the Mac Power Users. Our thanks to Squarespace for their support of the Mac Power Users and all of Relay FM. So, Neil, we will come back to Mimestream in a second, but you're a guy who's been in uh, in the Apple world for a while now. I'd love to hear about what gear you're, you're using. Yeah, so gear is fun. I love gear. 
Uh, and, you know, it has always been, I think I've always liked trying out new things. However, where I have wound up is this very vanilla setup, you know. So I, I do the studio display. I've got a 16-inch MacBook Pro. Um, I just got the, the little magic keyboard with the Touch ID sensor and a magic mouse. And this is like, you know, a very vanilla desktop setup. And uh, I love it. But I have tried everything else also. Uh, and I keep coming back to this. You know, keyboards are one area in particular where I have tried everything. <laughs> and I just... <laughs> I think I have decided that for me, it becomes, it can quickly become an obsession to try different keyboards, different mice. Uh, and, and then eventually I just kind of get frustrated with it. And I'm just like, you know, let me just go back to like the good old standby, the good old magic keyboard. Yeah. Uh, and it just, you know, it, it, it has the one big advantage of that. You just don't waste any brain energy thinking about it. And it's the same. It feels very much the same between your, you know, when you're actually like, you know, using your laptop directly um, versus like at your desk. So it's like, you know, the exact positioning of keys doesn't mess with your head. Uh, you know, it's not completely exactly perfectly aligned, but it is more or less. It doesn't mess with your head compared to some of the other, you know, like mechanical keyboards where things are mm -hmm. moving around quite a bit. Um but yeah, for me, it was just like, ah, it's not worth burning the energy on this. So I just, I just kind of stopped playing with too many other, uh, <laughs> too many other keyboards. But uh, that's, that's my Mac setup. Um, you know, iPhone and iPad, I, I am one of the, the crazy mini users that will just cling to the mini. And I just, I cannot let go of my iPhone mini. You know, I've tried the, I've tried larger phones. I've had, yeah, I used to have a plus in the past and, um, but every time I've ever had a large size phone, I've just just found myself unhappy with with it after a few months. It's just too difficult to fit in my pocket and it's just unwieldy in my pocket. And I think for my personal usage, like I just tend to like I tend to spend less time on my phone than most people do. Um, and I tend to spend more time like casually at home with my with my MacBook. Like if I'm on the couch and I just want to browse for something, I don't take out my phone. I just grab my laptop and I just, I just kind of always have it within reach. I don't know. I think that might've just been like, you know, the era that I was kind of raised in. And, you know, like I grew up with like AIM is like a thing. So just that uh, to me was just like how you chat with your friends and how you yeah. chat with people. Same. Uh, <laughs> you do it, so on, you do it like, on the computer, you know, like it's, it's a computer task. Yeah. You do it on the computer. Like that wasn't something that I ever really did from my, from my phone that much. So, you know, it's funny when I'm at home, my phone is usually just on the charger and I don't really touch it until I leave the house. Um, I mean, I keep my Apple watch on all day, every day. I'm, you know, I use that thing like constantly, but that, that like, that serves the purpose of like having a phone at home. I just like, if I get a text or a call, like it just buzzes on my wrist. And so, you know, I, maybe, maybe this is not, now that I'm saying it out loud, maybe this is like, you know, why Mindstream was on the Mac first, as opposed to <laughs> on, on iOS first. Um, you know, may, may, maybe there was some element of personal preference there. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I find myself definitely in the minority, at least amongst my peers in terms of my like overall total, total phone usage is, um, definitely on the lower side. I will tell you, Neil, that you're among family here on the Mac power users <laughs> because Stephen and I, and a lot of our listeners are very much into our Macs. It's a great product. And it's like, you know, it's so easy to just disconnect and it's just a great, like, you know, why, why look at something on a tiny little screen and you mm -hmm. can just open up your laptop and just have this expansive screen and a real physical keyboard where you can just type twice as fast. So I, I, I don't know. I just wind up preferring it for most tasks when I'm at home. Yeah. And I can't do, I can't respond to like real email. Like I can respond like one line stuff from my phone, but like if I get a real email from like a user, I want to write them a real response. I need a keyboard for that almost every time. So I find it very difficult to do any kind of real work from my, from my phone. So for me, it's always this relegated, you know, background thing. Hmm. iPad is something that, 
you know, despite having worked on it from the beginning, I also find myself just very Mac leaning. Like I just, I personally struggle a little bit with the intersection of iPad and Mac. Um, you know, it works really well for a lot of people, but for me, it's never really clicked. Um, so mine has a nice little layer of dust on it right now <laughs> next to my bed. Uh, it's something that I, I, I pick up to read when I have the time to. That's sort of my main my main usage of the of the device. But uh, yeah, otherwise, I just am like mostly in on my Mac and my studio display most of the time. My studio display is probably my most used piece of electronics right now. Like that's the thing I look at the most. And it's a great screen, you know, it got such a bad, it got such a bad rap in the beginning for its camera and stuff, but honestly, it's fine unless you're in like a dark environment. I have no real problems with yeah. it. I use it, you know, I'm just, I'm very pleased with it. It's one of what, it's like a purchase that I'm extremely happy with. And, you know, I, I the XDR would be really nice, but like, I kind of like having everything integrated. So, you know, if, if Apple came out with like another XDR that like, you know, did a little more, it had like a webcam integrated and like speakers integrated and things like that, that I would probably consider, uh, definitely consider upgrading. But, you know, for now I'm pretty happy with, uh, the studio display. Yeah. I went from the XDR to the studio display to have everything built in. Like it is nice. The speakers are, you know, they're fine. Camera's fine. Like it's all in one is you, you kind of get some of the iMac magic with it in a way. Yeah, you do. And I, I use the, um, there's this book arc, uh, little MacBook holder that I, that I love. And it just holds your MacBook kind of upright. So like that, plus like one cable plugged into your studio display, that one cable does everything, charging everything. It, it feels a lot like an, it feels like an like all in one iMac. Um, it does have a lot of magic to that and set up. Wow. You went down from an XDR to a studio <laughs> display. That's, that's rare to hear. Yeah. Well, I also went from a, a Mac pro uh, and then a Mac studio to a, a MacBook pro. So I went from XDR to like studio, studio display plus an open 14 inch laptop. So it's, my system has changed a lot over the years, but I, I, I really like where it is now. And I think a lot of people are where we are laptop plus studio display. You know, some people like the laptop open, some people don't, but the laptops are so good now. Like, you know, you're do, you know, I'm sure working on mime stream can be computationally intense at times right doing audio and video and some development stuff myself like these macbook pros can keep up it's just fine apple silicon has made it where it, you don't have the trade-off with a notebook the, the way you used to yeah i completely agree it's amazing how little of a like i feel i i, I didn't i haven't even upgraded to like an m3 or anything i'm still running my m1 pro mm -hmm. um on my 16 inch macbook pro and this thing is just it, it just it rocks like i just don't find myself needing anything more than this. It, you know, there used to be that trade-off you'd have to think about between laptop and desktop. And that's just, that's not the case now. Like, I feel like the the laptop and one monitor is like, they're, you know, the sort of the best combo for, it's the best of both worlds, really. You know, a lot of people lament sort of the, the loss of that 27 inch iMac um, from the lineup. And, you know, I, I liked the 27 inch iMac a lot, but with this setup, I'm actually kind of okay with it not being around anymore. Like, you know, it kind of, it feels like, it feels like a good, simple, like, you know, just good compromise. It's just one cable, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not, it's not too bad. And the nice thing about it also is like all your scripts and everything, everything just works because you have one computer. So you don't have to worry about making sure that this thing works on that machine, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, it's so nice to have everything in one computer and not have to <laughs> would not have to try to like keep things in sync or worry about that at all. I mean, like it's a lot easier now than it was a few years ago, but it it is just nice. Just even like all your tabs open and like all your windows open exactly where you, it's, it's just so much nicer to just have one machine. I want to go back to the iPhone mini just real quick. Um, so you're a, you know, you're a nerd, right? You're a software developer. You worked at Apple. The iPhone mini is not the phone that gets the most updates. Like, you know, it's probably, I, I've kind of lost track. When was the last time we had a new iPhone mini? Was uh, it two years two ago? Two years now? ago. I've, yeah. Yeah. So the, um, you've got the older camera system. Does that stuff drive you nuts at all? Or is it just the, the small size trumps all? 
you know, it, I, I really don't like being left behind on the other things, but for me, the small size is just such a trump over everything else. You know, I feel like the camera system and USB-C charging are like the two things I can name that really bother me that I don't have. Um, but yeah, the, the last mini was the, the iPhone 13 mini. Um, and then, and then they were, they were discontinued after that. Um, you know, I, I just love the size. I think for me, it's just really nice to just, it's nice to hold and it's nice to fit in a pocket. Um, and, but you know, I, I get it. Like I, I, I'm not expecting it to be a product that really makes any, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to let go of this at some point. <laughs> yeah, that's my next question is like, how far will you go? Are you going to be like five years with this phone? Or you, yeah. I, I will go until, until it's too painful to keep going because for me, the size, I, 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 the, the, when I first got a 12 mini, the joy I felt from holding that phone in my hand, I'd come from a, what was it? The like pro max beforehand. Um, and the joy I felt from having this teeny tiny phone in my hand, I was just like, this is the best iPhone upgrade I have ever had in years. It just, for me, it was the most joyful iPhone upgrade I ever had, um, going down to the mini size. So I, I, I'm holding on to it for probably another year or two, and then I'll probably cave, but we'll see. I'm, I'm, I, I have this completely unfounded optimism that maybe a smaller size phone will make a return, even though I know it won't, and I know that people don't want it. Um, <laughs> well, obviously, some people do. That's the thing, right? I, there's some of us. There's some of us that like to be noisy about it, too, and we like it so much that we're noisy about it. But, uh, you know, I think I think it was pretty... I think I'd seen some sales, some, some like claims of sales data. I forget what the figures were, but you know, there were some, some articles written online and it sounded like it wasn't a especially strong seller relative to the rest of the lineup. Yeah. I love to tell Apple what they should do, but I feel like you're a trillion dollar company. You could make three phones. You get to make three phone <laughs> sizes. It's okay. <laughs> It'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Even if it's like only two percent of phones sold are the mini, like it's still a huge volume of phones. Yeah, it's like right. more phones than moving. anybody else. <laughs> yeah. I I would love if they brought it back because I I just I I think it's such a magical size. But uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe there's I don't have a cellular Apple Watch, so I had a friend who moved from a mini to like a normal size phone, and they went to the cellular watch, and they were like. Oh, well, you know, it kind of, it kind of, it, it was sort of the cellular watch took over some of the use cases of like the mini size or some of the joy that I got from the mini size. Um, I made up on some of the joy of having the cellular watch. So it's something I might try for the next one. This episode of MPU is brought to you by Indeed. We're all driven by the search for better. When it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate is not to search at all. Don't search. Match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. So ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed just doesn't help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree that Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Hiring is difficult, and it's really important you find the right person. And Indeed's tools make that much more likely. Because they leverage over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, This means that Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it'll get. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that are using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility. Just go to Indeed.com slash MPU. That's I-N-D-E-E-D. Indeed dot com slash mpu go there and support our show by saying you heard about indeed on this your favorite podcast that's indeed.com slash mpu terms and conditions apply need to hire you need indeed our thanks to indeed for the support of the show 
All right, uh, Neil, we want to dig in on MimeStream. Like I said, this is the email app that so many people love to use. And uh, we have questions and, and just kind of want to kind of get into it a bit. Uh, we already mentioned that this is a Gmail only app at this point. Um, why is that? So when I got started with, with MimeStream, I, I wanted to make something that would have a chance at being definitively better at something than the options that were already out there. And, you know, as I, I've always been like kind of a Gmail fan. Like it was, I, I was, I still remember going on to eBay and buying an invite to Gmail. Yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. That was a thing. That was, I bought an invite uh, and, you know, I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, so I've always kind of been a pretty strong Gmail fan um, over the years. And I've always liked what the team has done. Um, you know, I always felt like, you know, they've always brought they, they they were not afraid to try different things in in gmail and some of it stuck and some of it didn't but overall you know for something that is so mainstream i think google did a really good job of trying a lot of different things so you know the big differentiator for mimestream of course is that it uses the gmail api rather than using the imap protocol uh, and that enables like a whole host of features and functionality that a, a, sort of a traditional email client that was based off of the IMAP protocol wouldn't be able to do. So, you know, like if you want a really good IMAP protocol based email client, like, you know, I worked on Apple mail for a long time and I think it's a great, I think it's a great product. Um, and you know, there's obviously like any product, there are things that could be better or things that are you know, could could use some polishing. Of course, that's every product is out there. But on the whole, I think it's a really, you know, it's it's a it's a really feature rich uh, app that already can do quite a bit. So I just was like, if I'm going to do something different, it needs to be materially different. Um, otherwise, there's no way to like actually build a business off of it. Like if I just built something that was that just did IMAP, I don't know that there would be like aside from like, maybe I could, maybe I could be 20% faster. Maybe I could, you know, ha have one less bug or something like that. Like what, what would I really be able to offer users, uh, differently, um, than any of the existing competing products already on the market. Uh, and so that, that was my thought process behind why Gmail first. Now, Gmail obviously had this API, um, that gave us access to more of the actual Gmail feature set. So it just seemed like the obvious place to get started for me. Um, and, you know, on the Mac, on, you know, on the, on the iPhone, there already was an official, you know, Google made Gmail app mm -hmm. that did a lot of this. And a lot of people use it and a lot of people like it. Um, and, you know, it's actually, it's actually what I'm using right now on, on my iPhone. Um, and it, but that wasn't there on, on Mac OS. So that is the other reason why I chose Mac OS uh, right off the bat is because I was like, okay, you know, this, this, this app doesn't exist on, on Mac OS. So I'm not competing directly against some first party, you know, some first party offering like from, from Google directly. Uh, so it just seemed like this little niche that was, you know, there was an opportunity and like a, a little niche and, you know, it definitely carves out, you know, some subset of users, but, what you know just informally when i talk to people there was enough people who have most of their email accounts on on google out there so that's <laughs> that's kind of how i got started yeah I, I think that makes sense a couple follow-up points i mean on mac power users for years people would write in and say i use gmail what do i use on the mac and the only advice i would always give before mindstream was just go on the web because all these imap email apps even apple mail that try to work with gmail don't really work with gmail <laughs> and it, it feels like you're always kind of in this situation where it's just something's going to go wrong and what had to happen is what you did you know someone to build an app against the gmail api i guess would you call it an a email api i don't know what you call it but the uh but against the gmail protocol to tool fully take advantage of it and that you know that just never happened before you but one of the, the things you brought up I wanted to also follow up on is 
IMAP. Is is IMAP at this point becoming too antiquated? Is this something that we should all be looking to move beyond? You know, I think IMAP is really good at certain things. Um, I think it has a lot of, there's a lot of prior art already built around IMAP, so I don't think it's something that has to be thrown out completely. But it is very much designed around a simpler model of like, folders and messages in folders is the fundamental model that it is built around. And Gmail was not built around that model. Gmail is built around messages in one bucket, all having labels on them. Um, And so that's sort of this like fundamental mismatch between, you know, the IMAP model and uh, sort of the way that Gmail itself works. And and that's been why, you know, in the past, whenever you use an IMAP based client and try to have, uh, you know, try, try to add a Google account to it. Like Google has an IMAP proxy layer. Uh, and then, you know, clients will use that. And there, there, there's some, there's some stuff that gets lost in the, in the mapping there. Uh, or there's, there's some friction that you can run into with that, with that mapping, which is, you know, to your point, um, why people have had some, some friction trying to use, you know, an IMAP based email client, um, with, with Gmail in the past. Uh, but you know, I, I don't think it's something that has to be thrown out necessarily. Um, there is a new IETF, uh, specification called JMAP, which is being championed by the folks at Fastmail, mm-hmm. and, you know, they're friends of mine. They're, they're really, really sharp people. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was part of the working group, uh, in the IETF that helped refine the specification. Um, and so I do uh, actively participate, um, in, 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 in standards definitions. And I think that that is something that it is really like clearly superior to IMAP in basically every possible technical way. Um, (laughs) and, uh, I, I really like it a lot. The, the, the biggest challenge for JMAP is going to be adoption, like practical adoption. And, this is both the blessing and the curse of email that there is so much, like everything is based off of open standards, but then, and and there's so many different parties that all implement it. So that's the blessing. The curse is that it becomes very hard to change anything because now you've got all you, 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 you've got so many different companies that all have to like adopt some new standard. And then you have a lot of chicken and egg problems um, where You need people to, you need like one big service to adopt something and then you need clients to adopt it. And it's like, who, who can you convince to go first? Uh, and so that, that is sort of, I I think right now is probably the biggest challenge for JMAP is convincing some other major service besides, uh, fast mail to adopt it, um, and to offer that as a endpoint, uh, to their email service. Um, if that can happen, I think that that might, that would probably be the single biggest thing that would speed up industry wide adoption of JMAP and moving from IMAP to JMAP. But, uh, until then, you know, I think that realistically both are going to be in a coexisting space for quite some time. And, you know, honestly, I would not be surprised if people are still using IMAP in another 10, 15 years. I'd be actually pretty surprised if they aren't. Yeah. Agreed. I, I am using JMAP. I am a fast mail subscriber. And in a lot of ways, I find their mail um, app more efficient than any mail app. Their, their, their email interface can be more efficient than a mail app because of this JMAP protocol. But it just, you're right. It's nowhere else. There's no app I can load up and connect to it. Yeah. They're actually, their, their entire, um, their webmail interface itself uses JMAP to talk to yeah. their services. Uh, and it's funny because that company is based in Australia. They ran, they, they like have a lot of servers in the U S so there's a very high latency of connections. Uh, like the latency of making a network request from Australia all the way to the U S and then back is pretty high. So a lot of their, like everything that the, the, those folks have designed is really sensitive to, to like round trip latency. Um, and you know, it results in a feeling of snappiness for, for everyone. 
Uh, but it was almost born out of necessity for them rather than like, <laughs> <I never knew. laughs> rather than just this minor, like, oh, it would be nice if we had this protocol that like was, you know, did this one operation in one round trip. So things can be 30 milliseconds faster. Like that's what a U.S. based <laughs> engineer would sort of come up with. For them, it was like if we batch these three things into one round trip, it's like hundreds of milliseconds faster. Mm-hmm. It's noticeably faster. So. For you know someone on the other side of the world, it makes a huge difference. Um, for us, it's a, you know in the U.S., it's a it's a couple milliseconds faster, which is which is uh, it's noticeable. It's definitely noticeable. Um, but that is you know I, that 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 I think definitely influenced the design of of JMAP. Uh, I think it's a really elegant protocol. Um, I would love, absolutely love to implement support for it. I'm like the 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 engineer in me just cannot wait to do it you know i struggle with like the the business side of me that is like okay well you know if we if we do uh uh you know mime stream for ios we'll sell x more <laughs> yeah yeah you gotta, versus, you gotta keep the lights so, on. i get it yeah we got, gotta yeah. keep the lights on gotta prioritize what's gonna you know uh you know it's it's uh, productivity software is a it's a difficult business so have to prioritize what's gonna get us you know, you know, keep keep the lights on and 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 keep things sustainable first. But uh, yeah, I, I I just would really enjoy doing um, JMAP support. JMAP is JSON based, so like from a raw development perspective, it's actually quite a bit, quite a bit more straightforward and simple to do than um, IMAP. Uh, so just from an implementation standpoint, it should be should be quite a bit simpler. Um, which is also one of the key selling points for uh, for 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 JMAP. But yeah, it's all going to be a soup, and we're going to be supporting. You know, all this stuff is going to be supported for many many years to come. Would be my would be my guess. Well, I, I'm glad that you're excited about it. But we also heard from listeners that were had other platforms that they're they're thinking about. I guess you know, like I said, your problem is everybody wants MimeStream. Uh, but some of the others we heard from is Office 365, iCloud, and, and IMAP. Are those look like anything that can ever work for you? Yeah. So we definitely, I mean, like in terms of our longer term roadmap, these are all definitely like the top five things we can do uh, yeah. is more services and more platforms. You know, for the foreseeable future for us, our platforms are just going to be like we're on the Mac. We're working on iOS. And that's, you know, kind of going to be like the Apple platforms is the foreseeable limit. Like, I don't think we're going to be doing an Android app anytime soon. We're going to be doing all this other stuff way before we ever get to that point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, but services is certainly something IMAP in, in, IMAP in particular is something that gets a lot of requests because it would unlock a lot of use cases, uh, you know, it would unlock a lot of services. You can use IMAP with, with FastMail too. Uh, and it works pretty well. Um, and so it would unlock that. Uh, it would obviously work for iCloud and Yahoo and, uh, you know, other other services as well. It's kind of like the baseline. Uh, but I think we, the challenge we face is that we sort of have the inverse, the inverse problem of, you know, David, you had talked on, touched on like how IMAP based clients are kind of funky with, with, with Gmail. Well, MimeStream is very geared towards Gmail. So now to flip that around and do something IMAP based is like there's some funkiness going the other direction now. Sure. Of that making sure that's really compatible. And there and there's some some oddities there. So I think that uh that is is definitely, you know, going to be a little bit trickier for for us to do. Right now, we've decided that the priority is going to be iOS first. Uh, and that's what we're kind of like heads down working on. It's like our sort of the main development project that we have going on at the, at the moment. Um, and the thought is, I, you know, if, if we're going to recruit a larger for, for the users that we already have and for the, the type of user that we've already targeted, I want to be able to present like a complete full end to end solution that just like covers every, like your needs completely. Yeah, and sure. then expand to other types of other other users and other personas after that. Uh, <laughs> you got to take so, care of your existing customers. I mean, that's 
Yes, you do. You do. And it's a matter of, it's a matter of prioritization. So, I mean, realistically, I think out of all the other things like doing IMAP would make, would make the most sense as the next thing after iOS, um, mostly because that would unlock like a much larger user base. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, this, this will, this will be something that sort of touches into the magic of MimeStream is sort of the integration with some of the other aspect, the like service specific functionality. And we wouldn't really be able to do that with IMAP. So, you know, people want it. Um, but I think the people that we'll be able to make happy with it are going to be the people that are most still mostly using Gmail and have like one or two side accounts that are IMAP that are like not something they're using that much like their iCloud account that they like receive some random stuff on, but it's not their like primary use, like heavy duty use email account. But Neil, Neil, I want, I want you to channel that little boy that first found computers and programming and how exciting it was. And just remember, <laughs> wouldn't JMAP be more fun? Wouldn't that be more fun? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> See, J- JMAP is JMAP would be a lot of fun because JMAP yes. we could do the magic. We could do the, the we could unlock the same that like magic service level integration that we have with Gmail. We could unlock that with JMAP. And Microsoft also has a graph API that has a similar like similar type of functionality where there's some expanded functionality, this expanded integration you can get with the service and the service specific features. Mm-hmm. You know. So that is also something that we're, you know, we hear a lot of requests on. Um, I think, but we haven't really decided at this point, which is the exact strategy we're going to pursue. Um, but whether it's, we, we, we go for the service specific APIs all the way, or if we just try to knock out IMAP first, I'm not sure which one, I think going to service specific APIs is probably what makes I mean, it's what's going to allow us to deliver the MimeStream experience for other platforms, uh, for for other services, um, and I think that that's something that is is going to it, it's going to be what sets the app apart from using something that's more generic. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's you know one one step at a time. We're definitely. It's it's definitely it's obviously it's something that you know would would dramatically increase our our potential user base. So it's obviously very high up there. Steven's over there going, "How are we going to get more guests when Sparks keeps beating them up about new features?" Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, look, y'all have a public product roadmap. Uh, yeah, the links in the show notes. Cool. And I actually have a, a question about that. Um, I've interacted with it. You know, I've I've voted on stuff in the past. Um, very happy to see that some of mine are, are making it up the list, but what was that decision like? I mean, you can't, you know, your, your t- time at Apple, right? Very famously a company that doesn't tell people what they're doing until it's ready. And now with MimeStream, you have this web page where people can submit ideas and you can see what's planned and what you're considering. And like, that's a pretty big shift. How did you come to that? And, and why do you think it's important to let people know what y'all are working on? You know, uh, honestly, it is something that I, I had to institute pretty rapidly after I started the first beta, um, because the volume of feedback was untenable. (laughs) Um, I, I was really not able to count. I mean, the, the, the main purpose of the public roadmap for me is to try to, is to try to count how many people want something, right? So we put up all the ideas that, you know, we, we, we know we hear a lot of, and we just try to get people to vote on the existing ideas. And that helps us add, you know, votes. So like iOS is something that like, you know, like tens of thousands of people have voted for. (laughs) Um, and it's very obviously the number one thing that people want, Mm -hmm. uh, out above every other every other possible enhancement to MimeStream, people wanted to run on iOS, and so you know that's like okay, that's really valuable to know um, that this is what what folks are fo- folks are asking for, and that's a lot easier for us to handle than receiving ten thousand separate emails asking for iOS and then politely responding to every single one of them. This is just a more efficient thing where you can just go click upvote. Um, I also all the like other features that are sort of 
you know, where, where you can suggest a feature, I kind of wanted to get away from email based mm, feedback on, on what features were there and sort of have people come in through this, you know, portal of a public roadmap and sort of submit their feature idea there and kind of the user experience of it. Like, you know, it's, it feels like you're filling out a form. It's like, you're not necessarily expecting an email response based off of filling out the, the form. Whereas if you send an email, you sort of have this like implicit, like societal expectation that like, oh, if they're good, they'll respond. Um, and I'm like, I could, I could respond to everyone, but then I would never have time to improve the app. So <laughs> Right. Yeah. You can't get any, any of your actual work done. <laughs> right. So then I'm like, I really just, I want to collect the high level data without having to, uh, and, and preserve as much time as possible to actually do the enhancements that people are asking for. So that was where the public roadmap came from. Um, you know, was a, was a desire to engage users inform users and collect data about what people want as efficiently as, as possible. Um, now I still, I mean, I read every single thing that comes through that roadmap. I read it, I read it quickly, but I do read every single thing, but it's nice because, you know, it's a system. I don't have to sit and respond to every single one. And that, that is, that's, that freed up a, a ton of time and I get all the value. I get to read it. Right. Like that, that to me is the, the, the value. And then, and then based off of what's in the text, uh, we use a tool called Product Board, and that has all kinds of functionality to like automatically link it, automatically link like any blurb of text to like an existing feature idea that you have on your roadmap and sort of like, you know, get a list of what, what people are asking for and what would be like the highest value thing to do for every, you know, for each type of user persona, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you know, there's, there's, it's a two-sided sword though, double-edged sword, um, you know, by having it public, you know, some people are like, oh, like, you know, are, are you, are you working on, on everything on this list? Uh, and it's like, you know, so some of it is parked there to sort of collect feedback, but you know, the, 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 the major stuff that's most asked for is what we're working on. It's just a simple, it's kind of a simple algorithm. You know, one of the things I have to ask is, you know, you, you worked in software development, then you go to Apple, like you said earlier, where when you're at Apple, you have a very narrow focus of what your job is. There's marketing teams and there's management teams. There's all people that affect the, a product you work on that's not you. But now you've got the whole widget in your hands. When you left Apple and you said, I want to make a company, well, you've done that successfully. So what, what have you learned about yourself in the process? I mean, it's not, I feel like it's not too often someone just starts with a hit like this. Yeah. You know, I think what I have learned is that I, I surprisingly, I still enjoy the hands-on the most, um, you know, everything else is kind of like that, that, that to me is where, and that's what I've done for the longest time. Like I've, at this point I've been doing email for more than 14 years, like, email on the Mac for more than 14 years. So I, it's been, that's, that's the thing I enjoy doing the most. Um, but I, I, I have enjoyed like really getting a chance to like step into other, other functions as well and like really communicate with users. Uh, and that has been really, really, uh, rewarding as well to like directly hear from people what they're looking for, what they want. Um, I will say the most surprising aspect to me was when I first started building this, I thought, because, you know, I, I'd already been working on email for a long time. I thought I was going to like have a pretty good idea of what everyone wanted. And then when I started making this public and, and, and soliciting feedback, I started hearing about things that I like had never really even thought about or, or really like even heard very much of, um, at at apple like you know i had not really heard these requests and then people started really asking for this stuff and i was like wow that actually like makes sense i don't know why i never thought about that you know like one example was being able to like control the notification schedules for different accounts so that like you know during working hours you only receive your work email notifications during work hours and then after after you know 5 p.m or whenever's the end of your shift your like email will automatically kind of go to sleep um and and in your work profile can mute itself uh and that was actually a feature we were working on before 
like the whole focus filters thing came into was was announced and, and came into existence. But that, that was an example of something that I'd never really thought about before at Apple. And that was something that I only really thought about or heard or even came onto my radar based off of, you know, direct, direct user, direct user feedback. Um from kind of like, you know, folks that are a little bit more power user leaning. Um, and that was one that we we heard a, a surprising amount of. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd been frequently surprised by some of the feedback that we had heard. Hmm. Um, and it was, it was really, really exciting to hear. Of course, having that business requires uh, a business model. Uh, I know MimeStream was in beta for, for quite a while and it was, it was free during the beta. But in 2023, I believe you sort of launched the 1.0. Uh, tell us about the business model and the decisions that went into kind of landing where you are with the subscription. Yeah, so May 2023 is when we launched. So we're coming up on our one-year anniversary of being a publicly 1.0, you know, post 1.0 app. Um, so it took a long time to build the app in, in beta. Um, I invested, you know, a couple of years of my life and a lot of my savings also to hire people to uh, grow the team and and help out. We never raised any venture capital money. I just did this from, you know, just just my own savings. But, it, you know, it just took a while to build something that was compelling uh, and and had enough features uh, to sort of stand on its own two legs as a viable uh, as a viable product out there in the, in the marketplace. Um, so that's, that's kind of like the main reason for the beta taking la- maybe lasting a little longer than most betas really usually last. Uh, we were in beta for like two and a half years, um, before coming out, but man, it was just, uh, we did a lot of updates in that time. We were like, you were just shipping updates all the time and just, fixing things, improving things. It just took a long time to get to a point where, you know, I felt like it was, it was a really viable product for the monetization uh, approach that we were, you know, that would enable the company to have a future. So pricing for Mindstream is a subscription-based license, um, you know, which is obviously going to uh, be a very fun topic <laughs> to, to, to get into, but it's, uh, it's $49 a year. Or four ninety nine a month, um, and uh, if you pay that, you can use it with an unlimited number of uh, accounts. Uh, you can also share it with your immediate family members, uh, up to five devices total. So you know, if you have a partner, um, you can you know share it with you know you and your partner. Um, that five device limit is is split between the two. We also have a fourteen day free trial. Um, doesn't ask for any billing information up front. You just kind of download it and just get started. Um, which is, which is really nice. It's very low friction. So you can see if it, you know, works for you. Um, and if it does, you can sort of, you know, uh, you can decide to keep, you know, pay at the end of your trial and continue using the app. Or if not, then you don't have to cancel anything. It's just like, you know, it's just an automatic, completely, uh, hands off, That's uh, cool. no risk free yeah. trial. Yeah. It's something that that's, that's kind of like, we stuck with that. Cause I was like, that, I like that. There's something I, I like, I know that might not be optimal from a business standpoint, uh, but I, I, I just like the, the simplicity of that, of that model. Uh, you know, most other, most other apps and services have you sort of start the subscription and say the first 14 days are your free trial. And if you want to cancel, then you have to cancel, have to remember to cancel at the end of your trial. So it doesn't automatically go, but, uh, yeah. So, you know, the monetization was something that uh, when I first started, I didn't really think that hard about, I wasn't completely sure where it would go and it still is a very difficult problem for uh for for productivity software i think that you have to find the right balance between um the features you have and people's willingness to pay and making sure that you're delivering enough value for uh what you're you know asking for and uh and 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 kind of just pick accordingly. So we did a lot of research um, beforehand on, on willingness to pay. And, and basically like all of the research was basically the, the, the findings I had were basically as soon as I asked people to spend even one cent, you know, most people were going to drop out because <laughs> uh, that's just the expectations that I think a lot of people have around software. Um, you know, like most, 
of the popular apps and services that people use are free to use these days. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, apps like Mindstream are kind of a niche tool for power users uh, that want something that is, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more tailored, a little bit more, uh, has a few extra things. Um, so, you know, if you try to go after the, the broadest possible thing, then you just won't be able to, you won't be able to monetize it because as soon as you make it one cent, you know, for most people, the Gmail web interface is good enough. Right. Yeah, that's a complicating factor, right? You're building a tool on top of for what is for most people a free service, right? You can use it with the Google Workspace account, which I have three in there. Like, I'm so glad that's included in the API. Um, <laughs> but you are competing or you're building on top of a free service to consumers, but you're also competing with a free built-in system application, which, you know, brings its own complexity, I'm sure, in trying to think about where do I stack up. Right. So, you know, that that the the free built-in option was also a big part of our like, are we freemium? Do we have a free option or not? And, you know, that was kind of why I went straight for just, you know, it's it's a simple model. If you want to use it, you you pay the subscription license. If not, the built-in Apple Mail is the free option, really, in a way. Um, if your if your requirements are are light, and that's usually what I tell most people if they're like, hey, I really like the app, but you know, I don't think the price makes sense for me. Um, uh, Apple Mail is usually where I, I point people to because I think it's probably the right option for for them if they're looking for an app experience. Um, you know, with something that's obviously free and, and built in, but uh, pricing is something that it's it 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 is it is the thing that. For all the other software company founders I speak to, it is the thing that, you know, I think makes most people feel the most uncomfortable um, in terms of just feeling like they've made the right choices with it. Uh, because it it's this unique problem where you can't easily, you can't very easily experiment with it a lot, right? When you change pricing models, Unless you're making it cheaper, <laughs> it usually makes people really angry. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing this a lot with apps that started as like a $9.99 one-time payment. And now there are, you know, some subscription that costs, you know, $49 a year. And they make that jump from like, you know, $10 or $20 bucks one time to $50 a year as a subscription. Like that just, it, 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 it really upsets uh, people when you change the deal on them. Um, so, you know, the advice I've given most people who have asked about this is just, you know, start, start with a pricing model that is where you want to be. Um, and so that way you can avoid having to change it on people, uh, later down the road. Um, the other thing I found is that the type of user is just, you know, it's a, the, the type of user we've had has definitely evolved since we graduated from beta and moved on to um you know a, a fully launched uh paid for model uh and we've gotten a little i mean we definitely the the personal users have definitely reduced in in volume and most of our users are kind of business users that are using it for at least some degree of business use um where it's like kind of really easy to justify and i i find the same thing you know with my own with my own tool usage like if there's anything that's business related and if it saves me any time, it's like really easy to make a rational decision. Like, oh, like I pay for apps and services that are like $120 for this public roadmap tool. I pay $120 a month for just to have this roadmap tool. Um, and for me, that was an easy decision because it saved so much time. And it was related to that for, for me to pay $120 a month for like a software tool that I would use personally would be really difficult for me to like, it would have to deliver an obscene amount of value for me to even think about that. Um, so I, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of complexity there around the, around, around where to land. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with where we are right now. Uh, and I think that we are in a place where we have in like, the 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 model and the mix is like just right where we're able to keep the lights on and continue to iterate and continue to build and continue to put up new updates that keep adding value to the app 
Um, and, you know, it's clear that like, this is just the start for Mindstream. Um, and it's something that I want us to be able to do and continue to build on like 10 years from now. Uh, that's something that I want to be able to do. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really clear that like subscription-based licensing is the only model that makes that possible. Um, at least for, for apps in, in today's world, uh, where, <laughs> I mean, so much of the work is just keeping keeping the lights of the app on mm -hmm. uh is 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 a lot of of the day-to-day -day work that you know i think i think unless you're a developer it's kind of hard to hard to grasp totally how much time that all can take sure i mean not only are you trying to to build in new features and like all the stuff we spoke about but you're building on top of os's that get updated every year you're building on top of an api that another company manages like you in a way you're building on on a lot of ground that you've got to you got to do stuff just to keep up with right you're kind of on a moving target at times right so it definitely is a moving target the gmail api in particular even though the api contract hasn't changed like the underlying behaviors and 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 ways that the api responds that does change uh, has changed plenty and and many times has has completely this like you know, even at one point, I think it was maybe start of last year, like there was a change in one of the HTTP response codes and it just produced this completely unexpected code path. Uh, and it just caused the app to immediately start crashing on launch for like half of our users. Um, and that's just the sort of thing where it's like, OK, like, you know, another company made a change. We constantly have to play catch up to keep the lights on. Um, and, you know, Apple every year continues to iterate the OS and, you know, while the APIs are stable is the underlying behaviors behind the APIs that often, often change. Uh, and that can, that can also wreak a lot of havoc in the, in the app. Um, I mean, basically with every, almost every OS update, even point updates, we usually have to make some adaptations in the app. So, you know, in today's same world, it's just kind of not that practical to like not have an app that isn't continuously updated. Uh, so it is just, I think it is part of the deal, you know, in, in the modern world and the, just the realities of the platforms that we use. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Ecamm, the powerful live streaming platform for your Mac. Head over to ecamm.com slash Mac Power Users and try it for free today. Ecamm Live is the leading video production and live streaming studio built for the Mac. Ecamm does all aspects of video, not just live streaming. It's perfect for simplifying your workflow. It's easy enough to get started quickly, but powerful enough that you can create just about anything with video. You can do it all with the Ecamm app. I do a lot of video these days with the Mac Sparky Labs and the Field Guides, and I'll tell you that video is hard. Ecamm makes it easy. Whether you're streaming, recording, podcasting, presenting, Ecamm can do all of that stuff and it gives you the tool set you need to do it right. You want effects or overlays, it's got that stuff. You want to add comments or have guests on, you got that covered too. Often when you're doing video work, you want to screen share or maybe have multiple cameras. You can do both of those things at the same time with Ecamm and a live camera switcher lets you direct the show in real time. So stand out from the crowd with high-quality video and logos, titles, lower thirds, and graphics. Share your screen, drop in video clips, bring on interview guests, or use a green screen. Ecamm Live does all of that and so much more. Their members are entrepreneurs, marketing professionals, podcasters, educators, musicians, church leaders, bloggers, and content creators of all kinds. If you want to work with video, you need to check out Ecamm Live. And you can get one month free today at ecamm.com slash MacPowerUsers using the code MacPowerUsers. That's a whole month for free at Ecamm Live at ecamm, E-C-A-M-M -M, dot com slash MacPowerUsers with the code MacPowerUsers. Go there now and check it out. And our thanks to Ecamm for their support of the Mac Power Users and all of FM. You know, I can't help but in, in the background of all the conversation about email, and as much as I love MimeStream and have used it for seeming like forever now, uh, 
email itself is kind of in this like philosophical moment. I feel like you have, you know, starting, you know, eight or nine years ago, companies like Slack, right. Coming out of the gate and saying, we're going to kill email. You know, you're going to do everything in Slack. And internally at my company at Relay, that has been the case there. We have very little internal email at Relay. It's all in Slack. We have lots of external email with members and sponsors and guests and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Then you have, of course, Microsoft making a move there with Teams, which is also interesting because they have Outlook and Office 365. It just feels like emails having this moment of like people looking at it and be like, where does this fit? Are there other tools that can that are sort of uh, lobbing off things that used to be in emails kingdom? And I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. This is something I do think about a lot uh, in terms of like especially what the longer term roadmap for, for Mindstream should be. For internal communication, I think email has undergone a very large shift in the last five to 10 years. Like most companies have switched to some kind of chat platform for internal communication. Um, even at Mindstream, I mean, for communicating amongst each other, we primarily use Slack. Uh, and that's just how we mostly talk to each other. Um, and you know, there's, there's many reasons for that, but it's just, it, it's kind of like the minor, the, 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 I guess the friction of having an email and having to like write this like long form, you know, message and send it and just the inherent friction of email. It's just a little bit more than you'd want um, for internal communication. So I, yeah, I think, you know, by and large, like internal communication has, aside from very formal things, and most companies has kind of moved on to on to chat, but uh, email nonetheless does not die. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of cases where email still makes sense. It is the simplest way to, at least in business settings, to communicate with people outside of your company. You don't have to set up anything. You can reach out. I mean, that's how you and I connected to talk about coming on um, this 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 podcast today uh, was through email. So mm-hmm. it is the easiest way to connect with people outside of your company. Um, for things that are a little bit longer and more formal, uh, it is also really a, a nice way to even announce things internally and allow people to sort of organize their information in a way that feels a little bit more long-term. Like my email archives for me I have email going back more than 20 years. Um, it's, you know, and I'm not, I'm not really as convinced that my Slack history is what well, in 20 years from now, am I going to have my Slack history? I'm not right. really sure about that. Um, so I kind of treat it as like, you know, in the moment here and now, blah, blah, blah kind of stuff. But for anything where I want like real permanence, email is still based on open standards. Like, all the messages are, I could migrate my email to another service. Even from Gmail, I can easily migrate to another email service if I want to. And I can keep doing that and preserve it. So there's some special magic to it in terms of, of that. Um, and on the personal side, I mean, it is sort of this, like, it's almost like this database uh, where you just receive all these receipts and confirmations and notices and things like that. And like, that's like the majority of personal email these days is like ads and newsletters and receipts and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I don't really know how else you would, how else you'd want to receive some of that stuff. Like, but that, that's sort of the direction that their personal email is going is more of this like database, which is why I think, you know, Really good search is really important for a, a, a good email experience. Um, but yeah, that's sort of definitely a slice of emails pie has been cut out by chat. But I think the total amount of damage that can realistically be done has been done. And I don't really know if it's going to change that much. I mean, you know, companies like Slack are definitely trying to do like cross company communication. And mm-hmm. I, I, I've used I've used it where, you know, I have like, uh, a, like a, a cross company chat between, you know, us and our, our payment vendor, uh, paddle. Right. And, and so we, we, we use it for things like that. And it is a little bit easier in those cases, but there's still some friction to getting that all set up. And, 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 and more often than not, email is just like the simplest baseline and it will always be the simplest baseline for, you know, electronic text-based communication. So I think there's, 
there's a lot of life left in it. Um, in 20 years from now, I can't imagine not using email. Well, I guess one of my questions, though, is should it be forever the simplest basis? I feel like there's a lot of people who are anxious about email and dealing with too much email and uh, not really sure how to handle it. I feel like the tools need to evolve more. And I guess we'll talk about that in the more power user stuff about AI. But I, I do think that at the same time, email developers, app developers need to start thinking about how can we make it easier on our users because because email allows anybody in the world to tap you on the shoulder, it can become a real a real sticky point for people. Yeah, that is, is something I have a hard time with too. Uh, it is an easy way to get in touch with anyone and to get that tap on the shoulder. And, uh, you know, but I, I've experienced the same issues with a lot of like, you know, chat apps, like you can wake up and just see like a whole pile of unread messages, you know, and some Slack channel too. And just, then you have to sort through it and it's sort of becomes the same problem. You know, it started as this like nice place in the beginning where it was like, oh, it's like this, you know, quiet place. But then as everyone switched more and more over, it was just the new, the new hotspot. Right. Yeah. So I think that like hotspot problem is going to be an issue. Uh, no, no matter what. Uh, for work contexts, you know, it's AI is going to be, I think, a really powerful uh, transformative solution for helping manage some of that and, you know, speed people up. But at the end of the day, I mean, it still is, it still is the easiest way for someone else to insert work onto your plate or to put work onto your plate. Right. So it it is that that's part of what makes email at least at work a little unpleasant to 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 deal with because it's people asking you for things you know if you you shift somewhere else then who knows it'll just be where else you shift to so all right i have an oddball question for you how do you use mimestream this is your uh your creation but you have to answer email too you answered an email from steven that led to you being here today yeah so we i mean the beauty of email is that it's interoperable. So we do use my, you know, we do use Mindstream alongside some other tools um, to help manage email. Uh, you know, I obviously I make heavy use of the email profiles feature in Mindstream. That's one of my favorite things. So I compartmentalize my like, you know, my personal life in one profile. So all my personal accounts are in one space. I compartmentalize my my personal work account in one space. My the support account I keep in another space. Um, and you know, all the stuff I do for testing, I keep in another profile. So I make very heavy use of that for my personal email. I just completely depend on Gmail's automatic categorization of things into those buckets of like primary social promotions and updates and forums. Um, and I just, you know, it took me a while. I used to have my own categorization system for everything. And I used to try to keep up with making new rules and new filters to, to, cat, to keep all the incoming messages going into my own categorization system. And a few years ago, I just went all in on their system. And it's just been a giant relief that like 99.9% .9 of the time, the message goes in the right bucket. And, you know, I just click on promotions and I just... I don't even read most of the messages. I just scan the list and I just pick the one I'm interested in. And I just mark everything red at the end. So for me, that was like a transformative way to manage personal emails to just enable all the automatic categorization buckets and to just process it with a different mindset in each bucket. You know, obviously updates contains like all the receipts and stuff. So I go through that, like, you know, I will go through and look at all of those receipts, make sure that everything is correct. And I go through that with a lot more uh, you know, of a, of a, of a careful eye. And then what's left in primary is just real people that have, have messaged me. And I find that automatic system to be a really helpful way to, um, you know, go through my email, uh, work email is a little different. Um, you know, for my work email, I use a lot of like custom rules, um, you know, creating Gmail filters to move like, you know, all our GitHub notifications and stuff into a, into a GitHub label and get that out of my inbox. Um, so, that, you know, there's different, different contexts required, different usage of, of different tools. Uh, for support email, where we need to collaborate on things, we actually use uh, like a support email tool called Front, 
that's like for customer service teams uh, and that when we receive an email um we can collaborate you know amongst the team on a specific you know bug report and like you know what what are like the next debugging steps to take and what information to collect etc uh from a from a user so we use that in conjunction with email but it's great because it's kind of all interoperable and it all still goes back to the same account so um there's a lot of flexibility with email to like mix and match tools um and uh you know something that i think is part of the magic and part of why it's just really effective uh so that's that's the high level of how i use it well it's a challenge for all of us i'll tell you that <laughs> <laughs> it really it really is you know i try to also try to keep things on the you know i try to keep things on the keyboard as much as possible so mindstream's got a lot of keyboard shortcuts to like you know move messages you can press command shift M and then start typing the name of the label and that you want to move a message to, and then it'll auto complete that. And then you can just hit enter. And so I do a lot of keyboard based filing. I do do inbox zero, uh, in my primary inbox, uh, just to try and make sure I, you know, get everything that needs a response out of there. Uh, but I don't do inbox zero in the other, the categorized inboxes, like the social promotions and updates ones. I don't do, I don't, I don't do that there. Mm -hmm, um, sure. I'm just like, okay, if it's red, that's basically, it's good enough. I don't have to deal with it. So I have a split workflow. It's not like an exact thing, but uh, yeah, there's, you know, that's the beauty, right? You can, you can sort of, you wind up inventing your own thing that works for you. Uh, and everyone has their own little twist on it. Everyone does. <laughs> One of my favorite things in MimeStream uh, is that you can, you let your users pick do I want to use the Gmail shortcuts or Apple Mail shortcuts? So for me, coming from Apple Mail for 100 years, like Command Shift D to send an email is like burned into my left hand, right? Like I just, it was so great to be able to like, oh, I don't have to relearn these. But people coming from the web, Gmail has their own ideas about shortcuts. Well, you cater to those users too. I just, I love that little, or I'm sure it wasn't little, I'm sure it was a nightmare. Uh, I love that affordance you give your users to kind of choose how they want to work yeah that's something we hear a lot about being able to choose your own keyboard shortcuts the chemo the the command shift d shortcut is especially interesting uh because in apple mail that means send the message whereas in gmail on the web that means discard the message yeah. <laughs> no can't be any more different <laughs> So, do you know, so do you know the legend behind that? How did Command Shift D? It seems like three different keys to send an email. How did that become the shortcut? I I wish I knew. That predated <laughs> me showing up. I mean, Command S and Command Shift S were like taken by save. So I mean, like I think that the standard there was, you know, to find then another unifying character that, you know, like usually the if the first uh, letter of the menu item. So all the, all the keyboard shortcuts are tied to a menu item, right? That's how kind of Mac OS works. Well, generally speaking, keyboard shortcuts should be tied to a menu item. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, the, the, the correct way to build an app, even though you can handle keyboard shortcuts separately. And so, you, you know, you start with the first letter and if the first letter is taken, then you just try the last letter. And then if that's taken, then you just have to try something else in between. So the, the D came from the end of send, I'm sure. And that's yeah. just where it became command shift D. Uh, why not command? I, we, we don't do that by default. I found that to be too confusing. So we, the, the default mindstream shortcuts are mostly Apple mail inspired, except in cases where I am puzzled, then we deviated. So for, you know, the default shortcuts command and return are, is the send shortcut, uh, in, in MindStream, uh, rather than the command shift D. Uh. Yeah. A ages ago, I made a keyboard maestro script that if I type command shift, no, I'm sorry. If I type command enter in Apple mail, it, it types command shift D. So I've kind of reprogrammed myself. <laughs> there you go. When you came on today, uh, a lot of people were asking, like, why is MimeStream so good? I think the, the answer is because of your enthusiasm and uh, and your team. I, it really is great to see somebody out in the world, not at one of these huge companies, enthusiastically making an email application and pursuing it. Um, if you're using Gmail, uh, gang, go check out MimeStream. Uh, Neil, where, where should people go to to follow up and learn more about the app and the things you guys do. 
Yeah, I mean, the best way to stay in touch with us is to go to our website, mimestream.com, uh, and then join the newsletter uh, at the bottom of the of the homepage. Um, you know, we send out periodic email blasts. Uh, naturally, that contains the most information uh, and is how we prefer to let people know about things that are happening in the world of Mimestream. Uh, you can also follow us on X uh, and Mastodon and LinkedIn. Um, our handles are just Mimestream on all those. Uh, so we are, you know, posting there as well. Um, but uh, email is probably the, the the best way to stay in touch. And we're also putting a link in the show notes for the uh, for the product roadmap. So like if you just wanted to go in and say JMAP is a good idea, you could do that, <laughs> among other things. And, uh, and c- congratulations on all of the success. It's just uh, we're... All of us in the community are very happy that MimeString exists and gives us options that aren't just from Apple or Google or the other big players. Well, thank you. I'm uh, excited to continue to build that app. All right. We are the Mac Power Users. You can find us over at relay.fm slash MPU. Thank you to our sponsors today, Squarespace, Indeed, and Ecamm. Uh, if you are a more Power User subscriber, which gets you the ad for extended version on the show, stick around. We're going to bend Neil's ear about AI. Otherwise, we'll see you next time.